The Guayaquil in Quito, or good and quick if you go by its nickname, is known to us in the States mostly because of a small section dedicated to it in National Geographic's Love Those Trains, which shows us a world of diesel, steam, and rail bus from the coastal plain of Guayaquil to the capital of Quito. Built to make it in between these two cities a less arduous task, a complex history lies within this seemingly simple railroad. To begin with, the railway didn't even start in Guayaquil. The origins of what is the G&Q date back to 1872, when the FCD Yaguchi started in the town of the same name, building east with three-foot gauge track toward the mountains. The name was changed to the FC Del Sur in 1875, and track reached the foothill town of Bukai by 1888. Around the same time, a line was built west to Duran, just across the river from Guayaquil. A ferry service would be provided to actually connect Guayaquil. This is also where the railroad would build its main shops. Construction continues to just above Bukai and came to an abrupt halt. The engineers are unsure how to continue into the Andes. This was costing the railroad revenue, and the government was not happy about the line to Quito being quite short of its goal. Something had to change. Eloy Alfaro became president of Ecuador in 1895, with the goal of making the railroad get through to Quito. He commissioned English engineer Sigvold Muller to complete a new route, and a new contract was written up. In 1898, the Guayaquil and Quito Railway Company was incorporated in New Jersey, and it quickly took over the FC Del Sur. Track was regaged to 3 foot 6 inches, and construction began in earnest. The line from Bukai to Alausi was the biggest challenge, with grades at an average of 4%, a section where the main line loops back twice to gain height, and most famously, El Nariz del Diablo, or the Devil's Nose, where the railroad climbed several hundred feet via a series of switchbacks clung to the mountainside. It took six years to reach Riobamba, and another two to finally reach Quito. 260 and number 8 led the first official train into town in 1908. Finally, a trip from the coast to the mountains was no longer a week or more affair. The good and quick could get you there in two days. Following off FC Del Sur's number pattern, the G&Q began to order motive power of its own. 260s 10 and 11 were the first to arrive, originally being built for 3-foot gauge and ordered but regaged upon arrival. Engines 7, 8, 9, 12, 13, and 14, also two 60s of the same design but built for Cape Gauge at the onset, followed in 1901. All were delivered in Baldwin's olive green and gold. Most of the FC Del Sur's engines were regaged and held on until the early teens or until they could be replaced. In 1905, a pair of 0660s were tried but were not liked, and the GNQ went back to Baldwin to order the first of what would become the type of engine associated with the railroad. 280 consolidations. The first engines, 19 through 26, differed vastly from later engines as they were all built as Vauclane compounds, and may have been some of the last of this type in service worldwide. From these on, though, the GNQ 280 just continued to develop. Starting in the early 20s, the 30 series set in motion what would become the regular performer on the railroad for years to come. By early 1930, the railroad had been mostly handed over to the Ecuadorian government, becoming the Empresa de Ferrocarriles Ecuatoranios, or Ecuadorian Railways Company. However, the railroad continued to be referred to as the GNQ. At the same time, the railroad became the Southern Division, as it joined other railroads now owned by the government. Major players included the Simbambe Cuenca Railway, which ranged from a junction at the bottom of Devil's Nose to Cuenca, Ecuador's third largest city. Construction was started in 1914, but not completed until 1965. The line effectively became a branch line to the G&Q. The FC Quito El Esmeraldas, and later the FC Quito Al San Lorenzo, which ran north from Quito and back to the coast at San Lorenzo. Completed in 1957, most through freight traffic would be sent this way, although little is known about this line as it was plagued by more washouts and storm damage than the actual G&Q, to the point that by the 80s all that ran were auto pharaohs. Before the damage, though, the line was considerably modern, with French investment bringing Solzer-equipped Alstom diesels to work trains to the coast. Motive power under government control continued much the same for the G&Q, with more 280s being ordered from Baldwin, each a little larger than the rest. An attempt to change this was brought on by the purchase of three 262 plus 262 Garretts in the early days of nationalization, and while these machines could handle more work than the 280s, limits on train length on the Devil's Nose switchbacks made them a bit redundant. They were also a bit more of a pain to deal with, with longer boilers and mini blind curves in the Chan Chan River Canyon. The engines lasted in service through the 50s, gaining the highest run numbers of any G&Q engines, numbers 101 to 103, to make room for 280s in the 50 series. 
By 1955, the combined Ecuadorian Railways network looked very uniform motive power-wise. The main GNQ had a fleet of Baldwin 260s, several of which were freshly rebuilt, and two ADOs, their last batch, numbers 53 and 58, being the last narrow-gauge steam locomotives to be built by Baldwin, the last engine, number 58, being outshopped in 1953. Three Garrett still clung to the roster as well. The Simbambe Cuenca had followed its connections routes and had three Baldwin 280s built in 1935, smaller versions of what the Southern Division of G&Q had been ordering, while the Northern Division was a bit of a grab bag. Aside from the aforementioned Alstoms, they only rostered six steam locomotives, which all took up numbers below seven. Number one and two were the oddest, being a pair of Borsig built 460s from Germany. Three 260s were also on the division, having come from other abandoned properties that had once connected to the North End. And finally, one 280, number 3, which would eventually relocate and find itself on the Zimbabwe Cuenca as their number 18. Looking at the roster in 1955, it's clear to show where the majority of the traffic was, with three engines on the SC, six steam engines and one diesel on the Northern Division, and an amazing 49 engines on the original G&Q, the Southern Division. One of the reasons for the G&Q being well known is paint choices, as while most of the mountain engines wore black with a white trim, with some exceptions, the majority of engines assigned to the flatlands wore a bright red with yellow trim. The livery history looks a bit like this. As I mentioned earlier, the first engines delivered to the G&Q were in Baldwin's regular green of the time, with Guayaquil and Quito Railway spelled out on the tender. At some point, I'd assume in the late teens or early 20s, all engines were repainted into a much more drab black, with G and Q in big white letters on the tender. After nationalization, some engines were re-lettered to have an FE on the tender for Ferrocarriles Equatoranios. At some point after this, the common livery of G and Q with Ferrocarriles Equatoranios above it became the norm, and has continued to this day. I mentioned exceptions to the rule, and G and Q is great at this. Some 280s were painted black with gold trim instead of white. Several also wore all red with gold trim, like the 260s on the flats, and at least two wore an interesting green with gold trim and black inserts. Rumor is this livery was inspired by seeing photos of Southern 4501. Now I'm sure you're all wondering why some engines were painted red, and the answer is... I have no idea. This is still something no one quite understands, although the current rumor is that Garrett's were delivered in some form of red, and it stuck. Of course, the good times could not last. The entire network itself had been dealing with financial issues for years. Better roads and the Pan American Highway started to steal away traffic, especially on the Riobamba to Quito section. As a cost-cutting measure, the railroad ordered Alco diesels, built on contract in Spain in the early 1970s. Plans were put in place to retire the steam, but the diesels mostly stayed between Riobamba and Quito. Even when more units arrived, only a few adventured toward Duran, and steam stayed dominant south of Riobamba. 1975 marked change, though, as older classes of engine, or those too worn out for service, were parked and stripped for parts to keep the other engines running. Another cost-cutting measure that began to appear more during these times was the Auto Faro. The railway had always had rail bus services, but more and more began to appear, and their designs changed from a charming, albeit quirky, home-built botch jobs to Thomas school bus bodies slapped atop rail wheels. Running when a mix that wasn't needed or wasn't justified, these too became a staple of the G&Q, almost as much as the steam. The SC's passenger services almost exclusively became Auto Faro, along with running more premium service on other parts of the system. The Northern Division came to rely on them as storm after storm damaged the track, it being easier and cheaper to do minimal track repairs and run auto ferros on a line that was increasingly losing traffic. Tropical storms had always been a big issue for the G&Q, and was one of the reasons it got the nickname Good and Quick. It wasn't unknown for whole sections of the railroad to wash out, however service was always restored. The North Division was hammered worse, with the Southern Division and the SC tending only to have a washout or two in the Chan Chan River Canyon every year or so, and having to keep a close eye on the lowland track out of Duran. In the early 1980s, though, a particularly fierce storm washed out a large section of line and a bridge between Alausi and Riobamba, leaving the G&Q as essentially two railroads. At this stage, the southern end, from Duran to Alausi, became the more documented. Rio Bamba to Quito, starting in the 70s, had already become territory of the new Alco diesels, and at the time of washout, only one steam locomotive was on the north side, this being 280 number 15 from the Simbambe Cuenca. 
Number 15 was quickly retired. The railroad not wanting to maintain crew and facilities for one engine, and it was put on display next to the main line in Riobamba. The south end was nearly the opposite, as steam continued to hold down services with two diesels and a couple auto faros. By this point, owing to traffic loss in the 70s, the steam fleet was drastically reduced. Those remaining were 260s 7 and 11, and 280s 44, 45, 46, and 58, along with Zimbabwe Cuenca 280 17. Number 11 held down the majority of Duran to Bukai Mixto traffic alongside a diesel, with number 7 mostly being resigned to yard work around Duran. Number 17 also assisted on trains out of Duran heading for Bukai. The four 280s rotated out work between Bukai and Alausi, usually number 44 with another engine as backup, and a diesel. Other engines that had yet to become parts, but spent most of this time out of action, were 260 number 14, which after a lengthy rebuild would first be trucked to Cuenca to run excursions and charters over a short section of the SC, her weight making her ideal. After this line was closed, she was then shipped to the Old Northern Division and ran out of Ibarra doing pretty much the same. Big 280 number 53 would return in the early 90s for use on the mountain, but mostly for charter work, eventually ending up based out of Riobamba. Lastly is 280 number 18. The oddball inside frame 280 once used on the Northern Division and later the SC. It spent this time in the back of the Duran works in pieces, although slow progress was made and the engine did eventually steam again in 2008. As the 90s took hold, the washout was repaired, and new Alstom diesels arrived from France, which took over what remained of the services, both from steam and the few remaining derailment-prone Alcos. Steam continued, however, in charter work, although their numbers dwindled. Engines 44 and 46 turned their last wheel as the Alstoms arrived and were both retired to Bukai Shed. The G&Q may have still had steam, but bigger problems were looming. The railroad had no real income. Freight was pretty much gone. Money mostly came from regular passenger services for tourists and yearly charters. Track conditions were getting bad year after year, and less and less engines were able to perform for visiting photographers. It was to the point in the early 2000s that sections of the line were closed due to more storm damage. The rail's not strong enough to support the weight of an auto ferro, let alone a big Baldwin consolidation or an Alston diesel. Number 53 and 58 were still operational, but parts had to be swapped between the two just to have one of them be standable for charters. Number 11 was still capable, but the track from Durand to Bukai was in such a state of disrepair trains could barely run on it. The major performer during the last few charters became number 17. She was lighter than the other two Edos, and as the track on Devil's Nose had deteriorated, the larger engines couldn't run there. Number 17 was not in good health. Wheezing loudly and leaking steam as she went, she could barely pull a two-car load. As 2007 came to a close, it was starting to be a question of how much longer steam could last here, let alone the railroad itself. After struggling on with more derailments and general disrepair, it was believed the G&Q would be gone for good sooner rather than later. However, this was dispelled when in 2008, it was announced the road would be completely rebuilt. Track work and infrastructure, rolling stock, and most importantly, all the steam on site would receive overhauls. This sounded too good to be true. And it was, as the deadline for completion in 2009 came and went with only minimal tie replacement. 2010, though, told another story. Concrete ties, new rail, new ballast, diesels sent for repair. By early 2013, it was like a whole new railroad had been built on the G&Q. Shiny rebuilt diesels returned from Spain pulling fancy rebuilt or brand new coaches. One question remained, though. Where was the steam? Number 53 answered that question as she steamed out of Duran with a test train in 2013. Number 11 soon followed, and over the next two years, numbers 58, 14, 17, and 45, who had been sitting neglected in Quito since the mid-90s, were back in steam for use on Train Crucero, the new luxury train that would run the full route, sadly only a section or two behind steam power. Number 18, too, got a full rebuild, and was sent back home to Ibarra as a swap with number 14, the line having its own tourist service, but due to landslides and washouts, not connected to the rest of the network, at least at the date of writing. Sadly, the nature of the G&Q couldn't stay away forever, and right before COVID hit, it was discovered the company was again running at a loss, and that several sections were once again storm damaged. COVID, of course, did not help things, and the newly established company who had taken over running the road filed for bankruptcy. Why this came about is not clear, but many credit it to the new private company trying to mimic operations of neighboring Peru Rail that run trains to Machu Picchu and several other locations. The difference being Peru Rail also runs freight operations, while the G&Q was exclusively relying on the tourist market with its multi-day train Crucero and several other shorter trips, with no real interest in steam charters, only running a couple before the operation shut back down. 
The road has gone up back under government control as of writing, and several companies are interested in assisting in the day-to-day -day running of the railroad, but nothing has happened yet aside from trains not running. It is hoped the new owner decides to continue running steam here, even if only for visiting charter groups, as it has become part of what makes the railroad special. And we can only hope the sound of a hard-working Baldwin 280 will once again be heard making its way up the Chan Chan River Canyon on the good and the quick. <laughs>